starting to think that these two teams here locally are feeling the heat. That they're scrambling maybe a little more than they might want to admit. With today being three weeks until you, the Jackson County voter, go to the polls to vote on a three-eighths cent sales tax to keep these two teams in Jackson County for decades to come. So yesterday, uh, we wrapped up the show letting you know about this um, these different events that were taking place around town. And at 2.30 in the afternoon, ownership, eh, not ownership, but uh, folks involved with the Royals and the Chiefs, Brooke Sherman, who was the COO of the Royals, and Mark Donovan, the president of the Chiefs, held a press conference of their own at Union Station. And this was taking place before the Jackson County Legislature held its own public hearing at the county courthouse. And then, later in the day at 6 o'clock, Mayor, former Mayor Sly James and former Kansas City Councilwoman Becky Nace held their own press conference. Sly James is in favor of the stadium. Becky Nace is the chairwoman for the Committee Against New Royals Stadium Taxes. So I I kind of monitored all three events yesterday. And the one that stood out to me was the one with the Royals and the Chiefs. I listened as Brooke Sherman and Mark Donovan talked to you and talked to the Jackson County voter about why they believe this is a great idea. And what they kept coming back to is how this deal for you is actually better than the last deal was. Here's Mark Donovan. Really what we're doing is we're negotiating a better deal for Jackson County that keeps two teams in this county, in this city, in this region, and provides a brand new stadium and a really cool renovated stadium. All right. Now, I keep hearing the word keeps, keeps them here, keeps them in this county, keeps them in this region, implying, if you read between the lines, that If you don't vote yes, well, who knows? It's anybody's guess. Might just pick up and leave. There's kind of this veil threat going on that I'm sensing as we get closer and closer to this vote coming up three weeks from today. And towards the end of the press conference, it was only a 13-minute press conference. It was not very long. Uh, Towards the end of it, Both guys, Mark Donovan and Brooke Sherman, were asked, basically, is this a threat? And let's start off with Mark Donovan, who was a little more forthright when he got asked whether or not they are basically threatening the taxpayer of Jackson County. We've committed hundreds of millions of dollars to that asset that is Carabetsy, which is a county asset. We are committing to do that for another 25 years and commit even more hundreds of millions in the maintenance and upkeep. In addition to that, we as an organization and the Hunt family are going to put the biggest investment they've ever made on top of that to renovate it and make it one of the best buildings ever for the next 25 years. And for that, we're asking for, on April 2nd, for our Jackson County voters, our fans, taxpayers, to see if they agree with that. And if they don't, we'll be in a situation where we're gonna look at other options. It's just a reality. This is, if they don't believe this deal, which is a better deal than they currently have, is good enough that it leaves in a situation where we have to get our option. That's Mark Donovan saying there at the very end, if the taxpayers don't agree with us that this is a really good deal for them, then you know what? We've got to look at other options. How does that make you feel as a Jackson County resident? If you're someone who has supported this team, whether it's for five years or 50 years, doesn't matter. You've been here in town. You supported this team. You've rooted for this team. You've been the games. You've spent your hard-earned money at their ballpark. You've spent money on making a lot of people very wealthy out there. How does that make you feel? When three weeks out, you've got the team president saying, listen, if you don't vote yes, we got to look at other options. Uh, Mark Donovan just said it. It's not me putting words in his mouth. You heard there what he said. Now, Brooke Sherman, the COO of the Royals, he was asked the very same question. Is this basically a threat? And he took a less direct approach in his response. Yeah, And again, we've been at this for a while and we've gotten ourselves to this point. 
This is the time to do this. Um, the last two times that the leases were restructured, there were seven years left and nine years left uh, before those leases expired. We're at six now. And it's time to do this. These things take time. Uh, once we get a yes vote to get them planned, constructed, uh, they take time. And that puts us, puts us out there a ways. So the, the time is now to do this. It keeps both teams here um, and in a very positive way. And it, what we're doing is we're just asking that that tax be extended to ensure the future of both these franchises in this county, in this city, for a long time. And that, that's what we're asking. We think, we think we've got great projects that, that um, will do just that for the benefit of the region. So Brooke Sherman taking a different approach from Mark Donovan when asked if you guys are threatening Jackson County residents by saying, hey, if this doesn't vote through, if you don't vote yes on this in April 2nd, well, we got to look elsewhere. I'm just not a big fan of being told by people that if you don't do what I want you to do, ah, yeah, yeah, we may have to leave. I don't I don't like that approach and that tactic that Mark Donovan just took in that response. Maybe a generational thing. I'm a senior lifer in this town i have seen the a's come and go i have seen the kings come and go i have seen the scouts operate for two piddly years and then leave so i think it's the reality of living in a small market so that's the way i i i don't feel threatened i just feel like you know you got to face reality when we talk about conversations that need to be had and truths that need to be said we're in a small market Mm mm-hmm and I get that. I, I do. Teams have come and gone, but I think the generation, if you haven't witnessed it, I don't know if you feel it as much of a threat. I see it more of a reality than a threat. How's that? I, yeah, I, I understand that. Mm-hmm. I, I, okay. I just, I sit here right now and I look at these teams and I'm saying to myself, okay, the Royals, could they go to Nashville? Yeah, I suppose that's possible. Yeah, it is, I guess. Do I sit here and fear the Chiefs leaving for fill-in-the-blank city? I don't know, Oklahoma City or uh, Columbus, Ohio. Ohio, I don't know, somewhere? Not right now, Uh, not anytime soon. I mean, that would be enormous if that were to obviously happen. But I'm still sitting here thinking to myself, okay, there's a lot of these deals that go through without a sales tax. They may get tax incentives, right? The city may say, we'll incentivize you to build this with some tax breaks. But very rarely do you see a direct sales tax go into the pockets of teams. Now, that's not me coming out against this. I have not come out for or against this in the months that we've talked about it. I've just brought up both sides. And I don't like the idea of ownership, not necessarily ownership, but top folks within the organization saying, hey, if you don't vote for this, eh, we might be gone. Because, by the way, don't forget what St. Louis offered the Rams, and they still ultimately ended up leaving St. Louis despite the fact that they backed up the trucks for the Rams to stay here, and it still didn't work. Now, having said everything I said, I don't like it. It's not like Arrowhead's falling down. You know, this isn't uh, uh, the old municipal stadium, the deal where uh, Denver was moving out of a 1946 stadium. Yes. You know, it's not that. Mm -hmm. And so that is annoying. Yes, exactly right. I mean, a lot of us look at it and say, we got a great facility, right? I mean, we got a great park, great facility. We've been paying you. And and we've been paying you for the last 20, 25 Mm -hmm. years now. So whatever happened to all that, which was supposed to be for maintenance to keep up two world-class facilities. So there's still a lot of questions that are out there right now. And I didn't think the teams came off looking all that good in that press conference yesterday. 913-408-7957. That's 913-408-7957. Today is three weeks to go. Yesterday was a big day um, in this town with multiple press conferences taking place trying to convince you on a yes vote. And if you're a Jackson County resident, whether it's the text line, whether it's social media, whether it's the phones, where are you at right now? Because I think the teams are a little bit in their own bubbles as we sit here three weeks out. And I think they need to hear from you more than they already have. Say his name. 
Travis Wolf, 12 year old boy, taken off life support from the St. Louis side of the state. And this comes a couple of months after a car accident sent six people to the hospital. Travis Wolf um, died or went into this uh, terrible, terrible life support with brain injuries the day before his birthday. And he was just taken off life support here in the last couple of days. He passed away on March 6th. And uh, Travis, who was in this collision back on December 20th, the night before his birthday of December 21st, was involved in this accident with an individual named Andrina Bracco, who is here illegally from Venezuela. Bracco is facing involuntary manslaughter in the first degree, two counts of assault in the second degree, two counts of endangering a child in the first degree, and one count of operating a vehicle without a valid license. Police said that Bracco was driving in the wrong lane when she hit the Jeep that the Wolves were in. The investigation involves eyewitnesses and reconstruction of the crash. Bracco is currently in custody and awaiting trial where she's being held on a $500,000 cash-only bond with a bond reduction hearing set for April 8th. So this 12-year-old boy, uh, Travis Wolf, was killed by somebody who had no business being in this country. And uh, this is just the latest example of why what's happened at the border is completely unacceptable and does have life and death consequences. This is somebody, Travis Wolf, who should be alive today if the border was not as wide open as it has been the last three and a half years. And we don't, you know, whenever the conversation comes up, people rightfully say, well, the vast majority of those who want to be here and have come here, even if they come here legally, want to come here to, uh, you know, just live in America and not bother anybody. And that's true. But one, it never means they get to or should be allowed to cut the line. But number two, it still has resulted in people being here who, whether it's doing things like what happened to Lake and Riley down in Georgia, the heinous murder that took place of her three weeks ago now as she went out for a run on the University of Georgia running trail or stories like Travis Wolf. 12-year-old boy who lost his life in this car crash because somebody who should not have been in this country was driving on the wrong side of the road. It doesn't matter. You might sit there and say, well, you know, that happens. That, that kind of tragic stuff happens all the time in this country, and that's true. But if it happens with somebody who's not supposed to be here, then it's an avoidable tragedy. It's an avoidable accident. And I think back to a conversation we had towards the close of yesterday's show. I want to play a portion of that with a caller some of you are going to be very familiar with. And that is uh, Larry in Prairie Village. And I'll get this up here momentarily where, you know, we go back and forth on this very issue. On whether or not what's gone on here in this country over the last three and a half years is one, sustainable, but two, as bad as it is? And the answer is absolutely yes. I think the whole border situation, you guys are making it sound like it's the Russian army invading us. Uh, I think it's totally Uh, overblown. And I think the idea behind your hatred of the whole thing is that you think illegals are going to come over and vote. Do you, uh, no, now you're just making up arguments. Do you no, not I see believe- it? Do you not see it a problem that there are eight and a half million people in the country? We don't know where they are or who they are or what their motivations are for being here. Do you think that's a problem at all? Are you talking about there's eight hundred million people in the country? Eight, eight and a uh, half million. There's three hundred thirty million people in the, in the country. country that have not passed through any kind of immigration. They just snuck across the border. Those people. Yeah. Well, I 
uh, yeah, that's a problem. But the problem is the border's too damn big to corral everybody that wants to go about it illegally. Okay. So you know, well, see, Larry, now you're, cre- now you're creating this false argument of if you what? can't stop everyone, why try stopping anybody? That's what you're basically well, saying. Are. There are portals where people check in for amnesty. Or yes. It's not amnesty, but, you know, yes. they're going to kill me if I go home. What am I going to do? That kind of thing. Yes. So and, and, the- and, and guess well, what? Effectively curtailed that. Stay in Mexico. If you are truly fearing for your life in a third world country, you can await your amnesty claim in Mexico. And that proved to bring down amnesty claims tremendously during the end of Donald Trump's term. Well, what was, how was Mexico handling that? Were they just taking these people in, giving them a motel room and feeding them? Not really what my problem. I, who cares? What, what do you care? Well, they're humans. I mean, well, I, I, I have a I, little I, sympathy for I, them. I, 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 I do, too. But here's the thing. If you are – here's what Mexico did, by the way, Larry. Suddenly, Mexico started protecting its own southern border because suddenly they were like, well, hold on. We don't want to house all these people here. So the, suddenly their southern border got a lot – safer as well it's amazing how that works isn't it yes yeah i mean you're never going to stop the flow of desperate people I, all I, I gotta say it's hard for me to be angry at yeah. them uh and I, I know you can always find an example of an illegal alien killing a girl oh come on Larry. how many other how many ever how many just everyday citizens uh, probably kill some girl somewhere else in the mm. country uh, that was part of yesterday's call with Larry and Prairie Village here on KCMO Talk Radio. And right out of the gates, when you hear what he had to say there at the very end, well, that happens all the time. It happens every day. I mean, someone, God forbid, gets killed. Yes, but if somebody is killed by somebody who is not supposed to be in the country, then it's an avoidable death. And that's the point that gets missed when people bring up, well, American citizens kill people all the time. Yeah, that's wrong. But I can't do anything about them because they're at least citizens. Separate conversation. Exactly. Would it surprise you to know there are 328 official ports of entry to the United States, plus 13 preclearance offices in Canada and the Caribbean? Very good information there, John. So not like, oh, we're trying to squeeze people through one door. Yeah. Right? I got to jump gotta across the... through Ellis Island <laughs> yeah. and get your selfie with the Statue of Liberty before you go on. What do you guys expect me to do? I got to run across the river at Eagle Pass. There's right. no other choices. No, that's uh, not true. Is that it? is not true. Not true at all. And now we have a 12-year-old Missouri boy who did not make it, was taken off life support after his family back in December was hit by a 33-year-old illegal immigrant woman out of Venezuela, who was driving over 70 miles an hour on a 40-mile-an-hour posted road on the wrong side, going the wrong direction, and did not realize it. Think about that. If you don't think this confirms the idea that every state is a border state now, when you've had such unfettered illegal immigration into this country the last three-plus years, what's going to do it? Like, what will convince you That could have been any of our families. And sure, it could have been any of our families with a fellow American citizen. That's true as well. But guess what? I can't do anything about an American citizen driving like a maniac, assuming they're a first-time offender, and God forbid, taking somebody's life. But for someone who should not have even been here to begin with? Not difficult. And don't tell me, though, oh, there's nothing we can do. You know, we have done something about it. Executive orders have worked, have been affected. The people in charge now just don't want to do it. They just simply do not care. And now the name Travis Wolf, a young Missouri boy who thought he was going to see his 12th birthday. He had been in a coma ever since, and he was taken off life support uh, just last week. Don't tell me that this stuff does not have impacts on Kansas and Missouri, even though we are not officially or technically a border state, and that any of this is fear-mongering or anything like that. It's not. It's living in the world that the people in charge of this country have created over the last three years. 913-408-7957. That's our studio line and our text line here on kcmo talk radio 95 7 fm and make sure you're streaming us this morning as we get rolling on the kcmo talk radio app 
Uh, we do have ratings for that big Oscar show that I know that you were just, oh, on pins and needles watching the other night. I know you couldn't miss it. Uh, the ratings are what you would expect. We'll share them on KCMO Talk Radio, 95.7 FM. Oh, by now you've heard the ad. You've seen the ad, right? We need you to vote yes on question one. We've all made Kansas City a major league city. Let's keep it that way. There's no better place in the world to play than Arrowhead Stadium. Let's keep it that way. Vote us We need you guys. We need you. Let's keep this rolling. Now, I remember a time not all that long ago when head honchos with both teams, notably the Chiefs, said that players were not going to be used in ads. Well, then that came out last week. And you've heard it on radio. You've seen it on TV. Well, yesterday, during this press conference that took place with Brooke Sherman, the COO of the Royals, and Chiefs President Mark Donovan, Mark Donovan was asked uh, by Jonathan Ketz of Fox 4 about the fact that they recently said they weren't going to use players in ads and basically asking what happened. And it's a great question by Jonathan Ketz, who I'd love to get on the show, but, you know, the goobers over at Fox 4 won't let him on, and I don't know why. I'm going to have to start calling them Woke 4 because 41 is actually doing a pretty good job as of late. I may have to take the Woke moniker and hand it over to Fox 4. I don't want to do it, but sometimes push comes to shove. you got to do what you got to do. But anyway, here was Mark Donovan's ask, answer when he was asked about players appearing in ads like the ones that you just heard as the Chiefs and the Royals try to get this 3 8 cent sales tax passed three weeks from today on April 2nd. Yeah, the question was, do you expect for your players to be in ads and, and create ads for you? And the answer was no. And I said at the time that we have had players reach out to us and ask us how they can help. And I also said that we're talking about scripted ads. So when Patrick goes and, um, and records the T-Mobile ad that you saw, that's about a day and a half of work in our indoor to create that ad. And that's what you asked for that. What we did was took advantage of the opportunity during the Super Bowl promotion to have them record one month. That's very different than a scripted spot. All right, so hold on. What Mark Donovan is saying there is that Patrick Mahomes appearing in the ad that you just heard is not really an ad. That's just reading a line. Whereas when he does a commercial for T-Mobile, that's a day and a half's worth of time and filming and things like that. Um, I don't know about you, but that's garbage. That is complete and utter BS. You think the average person who is sitting there watching their television and sees Patrick Mahomes in a T-Mobile ad and then sees Patrick Mahomes in a, another ad on behalf of voting yes on the 3 cent sales tax in Jackson County really cares or is splitting hairs on whether or not that's an official commercial spot because, well, one, he spent the day and a half on And the other, well, that was just reading a line, a one-off line. That's not really appearing in a commercial. If your face is on television during the commercial (laughs) time, you're in a commercial. That's it, John. Uh, Listeners never appreciated when I worked on a music station. Hey, you just played four commercials. No, I played two commercials, and then I played a promo (laughs) and a public service announcement. (laughs) They never differentiate. They just heard four things that were in the way of them hearing music. Uh, Yes. What Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs players and, and you know, Bobby Witt and Salvador Perez appeared in was a commercial. I don't care how long it took. I don't care if it took them eight seconds to read that one line. It's a commercial. And trying to, you know, split hairs on, well, eh, it wasn't like a pre-produced, long-form, 30-second spot. This was just a one-off liner for a 15-second ad. Just stop insulting my intelligence. Like, Mark Donovan is great at his job. I I don't know him. I'm sure he's a a pleasant man. But don't insult my intelligence like this. Just say, yeah, you know, uh, the guys wanted to help out. Might have misspoke. So we did a little ad. And they want to be a part of this. And they see the value and the future for both teams staying in Kansas City. Rah, rah. That's all you have to do. But doing the whole, like, well, it's not by technical definition, a 30-second advertisement with Patrick Mahomes appearing in it. Like, I saw. I thought, 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 I
think it's a little bit of the distraction here. We're talking about an ad that Patrick and Kelsey and all the people who've been part of this, they're, they're proud to be part of this. They're proud to support what we're doing. And yes, we're going to use it in that way. Are we going to sit and ask Patrick to negotiate deals with us? No. Are we going to sit and ask Patrick to spend a day and a half recording a spot for us? All right. Well, no one, no one suggested that Mahomes is going to sit down and negotiate the deal. So stop with the red herrings and stop with the deflections. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to hear there because he wasn't totally on the microphone. I was pulling that from KCTV5, by the way. But, you know, Mark Donovan says there at the end, we're not going to ask Patrick to negotiate the deal. Uh, okay. No one thought he was going to do that. I mean, you're the guys who said that the players were not going to appear in ads. And then literally a week later, they appeared in ads. And to call it a distraction, it's like, well, no, you put your foot in your mouth. And in this case, Jonathan Getz of Fox 4 is simply asking the question of, hey, you guys said X. Now you're literally doing the opposite of X. Can you explain why? You created that distraction. And that's the broader point here. The teams have not played their cards well. They have created their own issues and created their own distractions over the last several months, and it could come back to bite them three weeks from today. You know how you can tell when speakers start interviewing themselves (laughs) at the end, asking their own questions and answering them. You know that, wait a minute, just hang on to your compass here. Keep keep it looking at north, right? Because here it comes. Yes, when they start going off into La La Land on mm-hmm. things that no one was asking about, mm-hmm. it's like yeah. just just answer the question and say, you know, the guys wanted to be involved. So we decided to cut these lines, and it's a little 15-second ad. It's rah-rah. Get them involved. And that's it. But if this vote goes down, and I'm not convinced that it will, I still think it's more likely to pass than not. But if this vote does go down on April 2nd, and the Jackson County voter says, I'm out, I, I just I, I'm going to vote no on this. The teams will have no one to blame but themselves. They can't point the finger at the legislature in Jackson County. They cannot point the finger at you, the voter. They will have no one to blame but themselves. This thing got on the ballot before we even knew where the Royals were going to be. Now they're chasing their tail. I'm trying to figure out to do with the crossroad businesses, how to appease them. You've got the Chiefs who didn't announce until, what, a week and a half ago what exactly they were going to do with your tax dollars. The transparency has in no way been there like they promised it would be. And while I, I, I sit here and I say to myself, I see incredible value of having the teams here. I get it. I'm a big sports fan. I go to games. Their approach from the very get-go, which started about, what, 15 months ago now, has been all over the map, has been wildly inconsistent, and has lacked the transparency that they insist that they've given you. They claim they're being transparent. But anyone who's paying attention, the actions speak a heck of a lot louder than words. And one of the things that came up Uh, Yesterday is is that this press conference, I believe, by Brooke Sherman, the COO of the Royals, and Mark Donovan, the president of the Chiefs, uh, was done to try to combat the media narrative that they're losing. And I know for a fact they think they're losing the media narrative. And to that I would say, then start doing more media, geniuses. Like, this ain't hard, because a lot of what I heard yesterday, too, was like, no one understands the ballot language, everyone's confused. Then how about ads that do a little more than just say, vote yes, with Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey? If you think your obstacle right now is the fact that people are confused, then run ads or do media so people are no longer confused. Yeah, people are confused. I don't know what to do about it. I don't know. Maybe like talk about it where people are on radio, on TV, on digital and social media. There's a novel concept, but what do I know? I'm just a guy with a microphone. (laughs) It was pointed out early here that that language would be part of a problem because technically we're voting down the old tax and reinstating a new one, not extending, so it takes all this language. That's one strike. The other strike being that no vote somehow saves Kaufman. We've got, you know, people who want yes 
have several obstacles to get over. They do. Digging into these numbers a little bit more, uh, they just came out in the last 15 minutes or so. Excluding food and energy prices, core CPI inflation increased 3.8% on the year, both higher than what the forecast was. So the Fed's goal is 2% inflation, just so you know. I mean, if you say, well, it's 3.8% high, well, it's down from 9%, but at 3.8%, think about that. It's basically double what the Fed wants it to be. That's terrible. 4% inflation is not sustainable. I mean, let's be very clear about that. There's no way to sustain 4% inflation and feel good about it because wages are just not going to keep up. Now, you can say all you want about, oh, look at my 401k. Great. The average person right now who wants to put more to their 401k, who wants to save, to have a retirement, they're not feeling that right now. If you're on the verge of retirement, God bless you. I love that for you. But, uh, you know, for the average worker right now, that is meaningless. Kind of makes them feel a little good, I guess, if they open up their 401k. But it doesn't change the reality on the ground right now. So uh, these numbers are, if you wanted to see a rate cut this year, you're not going to get it. At least not in the first two quarters. You might get it. Late summer, early fall, I mean, I'm just speculating here when it comes to what Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, is going to do. But I don't see how you could have inflation at nearly double the Fed's target and be like, you know what, let's start cutting rates. I, this, this makes a lot of sense. Let's finally start cutting these rates. It makes sense to do it now. Let's rock and roll. Now, Jerome Powell did say, and we played the tape a couple of weeks back. I don't have it here on my screen right now. But... He did say a couple of weeks ago on 60 Minutes that he was not going to wait for 2% inflation to start cutting rates. But you can't, I mean, you can't be sitting here at 3.84% and decide you're going to start cutting rates now. Just wait to see what happens if you start cutting interest rates in this environment. I mean, inflation is going to go right back up. And I feel bad because, listen, we all would be better off with lower rates, whether it's, you know, wanting to refinance your mortgage, getting into the housing market, you know, the the car loan rates are to the moon, although our friends over at Volkswagen Lee Summer are having some great deals right now, so go see them. But I get it. I mean, it is is tight. And I would love to see, for everyone's sake, a rate cut. But how does Jerome Powell possibly do it? And if you get to the fall and Jerome Powell starts cutting rates – Ahead of the November election, I mean, people are going to be screaming bloody murder, and rightfully so, unless he's down to that 2% target. But even then, I don't know if it makes a lot of sense for him to do that. In fact, I wouldn't. Unless you get to the point where you've got multiple months of inflation at that 2% target, I, I'm not going there. And by the way, ask most people, I, they don't feel like it's 3.8%. You accumulate, and this is the problem with inflation. It accumulates month over month and year over year, and you're looking at 15, 20 percent when all is said and done. And that's exactly what Gary Cohn, a former head of Goldman Sachs and one of uh, Trump's economic advisors, was talking about when he was on CBS's Face the Nation over the weekend. And if you missed what Gary Cohn said, he said this. Even though the rate is coming down. Well, let's let's talk about inflation for a minute, because I think it's a really important concept for everyone to understand. Inflation has a compounding effect, meaning as you look at inflation year over year, you're adding up those numbers. You're not starting at a zero every year. So if we had 6% inflation last year, 7% inflation, and now we have 4% inflation, that's 10% inflation. So if you take a basket of groceries at the beginning of 2020, just a simple basic basket that cost $100, it costs well over $125 today because those 4% one year and 7% one year and 7% the next year, they add up, they're cumulative. So there's a huge cumulative effect inflation. So when people are being told, consumers, you're wrong, inflation's had, no, they're right. They're completely (laughs) right. They're completely right. And what they're more right about is we at least finally have gotten to the position where wage growth 
is faster than inflation. But we had not been there till the last few months. So yeah. people were losing purchasing power, and that's why people were angry. And then take on top of that the high interest rate environment, where if you thought you might have been in a position to buy a house because you save money, you go out to get a mortgage at 7 or 8%, you can't afford a house. Mm -hmm. So people got very frustrated because the cost of their everyday lives got very expensive, and the cost of investing in their future by buying a home got nearly impossible. All right, that was uh, one of Trump's former economic advisors, Gary Cohn. He ran Goldman Sachs uh, this morning. Rick Santelli, just moments ago, he's the lunatic with the glasses uh, who's usually on the floor on CNBC. Here's how he reacted to this report. And I think that's what the market's looking at. Now, if you look at two things that we normally don't talk about, but I bring it up now every month. If you look at the non-seasonally adjusted CPI index itself, which goes back to the beginning, or the seasonally adjusted core index, which goes back to the beginning, both those indexes today are at new all-time highs. They are almost every month. So your middle class looks at that, and the inflation compared to 2017, 2018, 2019 is significantly higher. That's right. That's Rick Santelli on CNBC here in the last few minutes. So now, uh, and this just dropped in the last couple of minutes, prediction markets are officially expecting less than three interest rate cuts in 2024. So the betting markets had it uh, well over three as of yesterday. And that number as of this morning has tanked after inflation came in hot for a second straight month. Um, now, the prediction markets are expecting 2.6 rate cuts. Obviously, that's just an average, uh, but that's what the betting markets have out there right now. And two months ago, the projections were for six rate cuts when the new year started. And now we're down to maybe two, possibly three. It's also the first time this year that markets see less rate cuts than the Fed guidance. So I think it's entirely possible we don't see any. Because if we get to Labor Day without any rate cuts, Jerome Powell is going to be very hesitant, as he should be, to start cutting interest rates with eight, nine weeks to go until a presidential election. Uh, unless there's overwhelming evidence to suggest it's safe to do that, he's better off just waiting until after November 5th and saying, you know what, I'm going to wait this thing out. I'm not going to bother um, cutting these rates right now, and let's see how it plays out. So uh, not good news this morning, despite the fact that, you know, Joe Biden wants to tell you things are great. Although that's why he waited 35 minutes to talk about the economy and the State of the Union. You know, he'll talk about Ukraine. He'll talk about January 6th. He'll do abortion. But, you know, the things that matter, like how far is my dollar going? Can't be talking about that. Wait till the 35-minute mark of the State of the Union when most people have turned it off, fell asleep, or are doing what I was doing, which was throwing stuff at my TV, hoping I wasn't going to break it. So I, that's why you wait. If you were confident, you wouldn't wait that long in the economy. It says a lot. What? Nine o'clock hour on uh, KCMO Talk Radio. By the way, there's a roundtable going on. Uh, it's supposed to start here shortly. We'll see if we can carry some of it. It is on uh, college sports name, image, and likeness. If you're a college sports fan, and you know this is totally out of control, by the way. Basically now, teams are just paying players. The idea of name, image, likeness was for college athletes to be able to uh, you know, do a car dealership commercial and make some money on the side. But uh, there's no regulation, and now what it's become is just boosters literally paying guys over the table. And now you have to have, like, a salary cap for your basketball team, for your football team, and it's just out of control. So Ted Cruz is doing a roundtable today with Jerry Moran here in Kansas. Uh, I tried to get Jerry on the show, but... I think he's only allowed to come on like once a year, so he couldn't make it today, unfortunately. But uh, I tried to invite him on yesterday and today, but I guess he was too tied up, so couldn't make it happen. Uh, that being said, uh, if we can carry any of that, if it's worth carrying, uh, we'll do that here on KCMO because I do think it's one of those things that Congress is going to have to get involved with because it, it, there's, just, there's, there's no guardrails at all. And I do think eventually that bubble's going to pop. Like, yes, the star quarterback for top teams is always going to make money. But, you know, you got millions of dollars now being sunk into these top teams in basically a pay-to-play situation. 
And at the very least, if we're going to pay the players now, then get rid of the free rides. At the very least, you can pay your own tuition if we're paying you a million dollars a year. I don't think that's too much to ask. I mean, heck, you got regular families forking out 20, 30, 40, 50 grand a year for these colleges. And then you got athletes who you're paying tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars still getting a free ride. That doesn't make any sense anymore. So uh, in the meantime, back here in Kansas City, uh, we are monitoring what is now three weeks to go until we find out whether or not Jackson County is going to pass a new three-eighth cent sales tax to continue the old three-eighth cent sales tax for the Chiefs and the Royals to stay in Jackson County. You see what I did there? Because if I say it's a new tax, some people will get pissed on the yes side and be like, no, 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 it's a continuation of the old tax. But if I say it's a continuation of the old tax, some people will say, no, 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 it's a brand new tax. So I kind of tried to split hairs there on my description of it. A continuation of the old tax that is also kind of a new tax. Well, yesterday, Mark Donovan and Brooks Sherman, the president of the Chiefs and the COO of the Royals, uh, did a joint press conference. And they got up to the podium and they talked about how they insist this is a great deal for both sides. Here was Brooks Sherman. We've been at this a long time from the Royal standpoint. Um, and, and that's fine because we're, we're, we want to do this the right way. But we've been at this a long time. Uh, we have, we think, struck a very good deal for the county and, and for the teams and are ready to get underway uh, with this. Want it to be a successful vote, obviously, and working hard at that and continuing to put the, to put the work in uh, to do that. So. so Brooke Sherman is saying it's a great deal for both sides. And obviously, I mean, that's what he's going to say. We expect him to say that. But obviously, there's many of you who are not feeling that way. There's a lot of people who are like, is this really a great deal for both sides? You have Crossroads business owners like Jill Coxon, who was at one of the meetings yesterday and certainly does not seem to feel that way. The fact that we learned that we were in a demolition zone from a press conference by billionaires. Um, they claim that they're making good with tenants with CBA agreements. That is absolutely false. Relocating a business is often much more expensive than the value of the business. While landowners... So that was from uh, KMBC last night. And there's many of those crossroads business owners who are not happy. Now, they're not going to sway the election one way or the other. But obviously, they're very much more likely to talk to the media. And they're doing a lot of that. Whereas the Royals and the Chiefs are really not talking to the media. They're running their little 15-second commercials on radio and TV. And they did this press conference yesterday, kind of last minute. But even the press conference itself was not overly convincing. Like, I'm not staking out a a claim on this either side. But I'm just kind of going into it with an open mind. And I watched the press conference yesterday with Mark Donovan and Brooke Sherman And it was 13 minutes. There were a handful of questions. There were handlers on the side who were like, all right, one more, one more question. It was kind of like Joe (laughs) Biden. Like, you know, they don't want him to get too many questions. And it's like, this is regardless of where this goes and regardless of whether or not you think that the Royals and the Chiefs should get their three eighths of a cent. What's indisputable to me is that the team is not and the teams, I should say but mostly the Royals because they've got the more controversial part of this equation. They have not been nearly as transparent as they have insisted they want to be. They have preached transparency for 15 months. But at every turn, when they've had an opportunity to be transparent, they aren't. Even yesterday, what they did yesterday was a press conference in response to other press conferences that were taking place like Frank White and the Jackson County Legislature had an event yesterday. So this was kind of to get ahead of that and to get their official response out in front of that. And that's their prerogative. I mean, that's what they should be doing. But to cut it off after, you know, 12 minutes and then to be like, all right, that's enough out of you guys. We're done with the questions here. When there were plenty of more questions to be asked in that room, what's transparent about that? Nothing as far as I can tell. And if you have to convince people that something is a great deal for them, I hate to break it to you, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it's a very simple 
concept. If you are spending a long time telling somebody how great of a deal they are getting, they're not getting a great deal. Just like, you know, if you're in a uh, new love story and you're convincing or you're trying to convince your significant other how awesome you are, you ain't awesome. You're not. You got to play it calm, cool, collected, show strength, show confidence. And now we're kind of in in the explaining part of politics. And the old adage is, if you're the one explaining yourself in politics, you're losing. And and that's where it feels like the teams are right now. Yeah, when you're proactive, you're out in front of stuff. Hey, here's what we want. We're going to put it right here. I think you'll like it. Like, you know, you're selling ahead of time. You're not reacting to, well, what is it that you want? Yeah. Right? So the times the Royals have been proactive. Hey, we're going to have an announcement at the end of September. Or what happened to that? Right. Right. So when they've been proactive, they've tripped on it. And now they're in this reactive situation. Mm -hmm. It is very reactive. I mean, that's what really they've been reactive for the last 12 months. They've been reactive uh, and and not transparent when it came to Clay County. Was that in the mix? Then suddenly the crossroads is back in the conversation. But no one can talk about it. Don't talk about it. Finally, they announce it, you know, right as voting is getting set to begin. Uh, It's been all over the map. And Mark Donovan kind of talked about this yesterday where he admitted that the ballot language for April 2nd is confusing. So he has put himself in charge of trying to make it less confusing to you. The reality is that ballot says is doing this keeps two teams in your county, in your region, and it does it on a better deal than they currently have, than the county currently has. We've actually committed to put millions and millions of dollars into this market to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into a county-owned asset and develop another county-owned asset. And for that, we're actually asking for less. So that's what Mark Donovan pitched yesterday. Now, in the people that I've talked to around both teams, they have been frustrated by what they claim is misinformation. And here's what I've said. And I've said this on the show, and I've said it to them privately and publicly. If you guys are upset about misinformation, then start talking about what you think or what you insist is misinformation. All we've got from the teams, they don't do any media till yesterday. They did a little bit yesterday. I can't get anybody on this show, which whatever. I mean, that's their prerogative. They want their ads to speak for themselves. That's fine. But their ads aren't telling me anything. It's just stuff like this. We need you to vote yes on question one. We've all made Kansas City a major league city. Let's keep it that way. There's no better place in the world to play than Arrowhead Stadium. Let's keep it that way. Vote us We need you guys. We need you. Let's keep this rolling. That's a fine ad, but if you're upset that there's misinformation out there, that ad does nothing to combat it. And I think they're starting to freak out a little bit. Because they thought they could put Mahomes and Witt and Kelsey in a 15-second ad saying, vote yes, vote yes, you lemmings. And maybe they're starting to realize it's not going to be that easy. And now they're like, wait, our side of the story is not getting out there. We'll sell it. You got a million dollars. You're giving a Jeff Rowe an axiom to get it done. And, uh, you know, Jeff Rowe just blew Ron DeSantis' campaign, so maybe he'll blow this one too. Well, to your point, you're simply suggesting we're offering this avenue. There are five open microphones in there, any yeah. one of which they're welcome to use I would love on any it. given day that fits their schedule. I would love it. Sure. And I'm not sitting here against them, by the way. I, no, I've but said it that. is that proactive, reactive. Yeah. You're reacting to misinformation because people are filling in vacuum. There's yeah. nothing there. So what? Let's see. Let's make up something. You know what's going to be telling? I am going to um, ask to do the broadcast from the K for opening day, which we've done the last couple of years, um, because we got interviews the last couple of years with John Sherman and Brooks Sherman and all these different people. By the way, no relation. And I hope we get approved for that. I'd like to do it. I, I just feel like I'm the only one in media at least asking some of these questions. I'm not against it. I'm just asking these questions. Whereas the sports goobers who are literally in the back pockets of the teams because they're broadcast partners with the teams and everything else, I mean, they, they are just blindly like, you vote yes. You damn it, you vote yes. And the funny part is, too, a lot of them don't even live in Jackson County. So they're basically asking Jackson County residents to subsidize their entertainment. 913-408-7957. 913-408-7957. It's 916. 
as we uh, roll through the final hour. Ray Stevens, of course, is coming up at 10 o'clock on KCMO Talk Radio, our caller of the day at the bottom of the hour. And uh, Quentin Lucas did a one-on-one yesterday with KCTV5 on crime in this town. And I am going to push back on this narrative every chance I can. We'll get to it next on 95.7 FM. Oh, look, there's our buddy Roger Marshall right now on uh, Fox Business Network as we approach the bottom of the 9 o'clock hour on KCMO 95.7. And make sure you're streaming us once you get to the office on the uh, KCMO Talk Radio app. So uh, Quentin Lucas did a sit-down with KCTV5. And he talked to them about... Uh, the violent crime issue that, of course, persists across Kansas City, coming off last year's uh, record-setting homicide numbers of 182. Now, let's see where we're at this year. Uh, Things are trending in a positive direction this year. Uh, We have, I mean, it's terrible to say this, but we have 25 homicides this year thus far through March 11th yesterday. And at this point last year, we had 28. So things are a little slower, um, if you want to take that with a grain of salt. But all in all, uh, you'll take every little positive step you can in this like town. like to see it below last year's trend in yes, any way, right? exactly. So, you know, you're hopeful that we'll be well below last year's record-setting number. So KCTV5 does this sit-down with Quentin Lucas, talks about this um, issue of violence, and continues to point to one thing, as if Kansas City is unique in how and why these homicides take place. Listen to this. You do need to get people to realize how do we resolve conflict? How do we walk away? How do you know that like it's just not that deep? Of the record-breaking 182 homicides last year in Kansas City, nearly 40% started with an argument. Crime data from the Kansas City Police Department shows 24% of the suspects were between the ages of 18 and 24. And an even deeper look at the statistics over the last decade show an overwhelming majority of shooters and victims have been black males. Are we doing enough as a community to reach our black youth before they become men? So they don't turn the guns. The obvious answer is we are not doing enough. Mayor Lucas said part of the challenge is too many young people have easy access to weapons. And oftentimes adults are intervening too late. Because it's easy for me to say, yeah, 11 year old, have some respect. But if your daddy got shot, if a sibling got shot, all that sort of stuff. And all you know is that respect comes at the end of a barrel of a gun. And that's how you're going to emulate it from there on out. That's Quentin Lucas talking to KCTV5. There has been this narrative for the last several months in this town that we need to figure out a way to have conflict resolution because people are shooting each other after arguments. And you've seen that data point pushed time and time again, that about 40 percent of these homicides begin as arguments. And the premise there. From the police department, from the city, is that, well, if we just had better conflict resolution, whatever that even means, uh, these homicide numbers are going to drop like a rock. Well, I went back and I looked up some data. And the most recent data on this I could find was from 2011 from the FBI. And this was national data. And it showed here of the murders for which the circumstances surrounding the murder were known. 43% of the victims were murdered during arguments. That includes romantic triangles. And this is in 2011. So you go back to nationwide data from over a decade ago. And it's basically a mirror image of Kansas City last year, where 40% of homicides are tied to arguments of some kind. And maybe it's domestic violence, it's, it's romantic triangles, maybe it's drug deals gone wrong, whatever it might be. But this idea that, well, Kansas City just happens to argue more. <laughs> like, I don't mean to laugh at it, but that's how ridiculous it comes off. When, and, and, and the police have pushed this narrative, the city's pushed the narrative, and the media, like a bunch of SEALs, have just run with this. Like, we just argue more in Kansas City, and that's why this is happening. It's like, no, I've got FBI data that's nationwide from 12 years ago that suggests those numbers are pretty much on par for uh, the entire nation. 
homicides stem from arguments. So this is not unique to Kansas City. And I'm not going to let leaders get away with this narrative because it's not unique to Kansas City. Well, and where do you start? You start when you're three, when the kids, you you teach your kids, you know, they have their temper tantrums, teach them the meaning of the word no. That starts there, that there's a line. Yes. Right? Yes. You can't have a temper tantrum out in public, mm-hmm. get that kind of thing. So you start there. It's not like we need to enroll in classes like driver's license and renew every year on conflict resolution. Yeah. It's a lack of... Uh, you, you can learn it in church, and if you don't want to go to church, it should be taught in school at a very young age. Kids yeah. like to fuss over who's got the kickball, et cetera, et cetera. Right there is a teachable moment. Parenting, obviously, plays an yeah. enormous mm-hmm. role. You can have uh, you know, the church. You can have your communities. You can have, yes, your teachers play a role in this, your school administrators. Everyone plays a role. There's no doubt about it. But uh, the idea that Kansas City fights more. Kansas City argues more. And if we had, like, conflict resolution programs, I don't even know what that means. I'm just making up these fancy words that bureaucrats like to use. And we would drop the homicide rate. Now, you know what you do? The first thing you do, and this is what I would do nationwide, by the way, if I had the almighty, you know, magic wand. I would build more jails, all right? Put these union guys to work, building more prisons around the country, and get the worst of the worst people off the streets in every major American city. And it'll be amazing how much crime, especially homicides, will go down. Like, this is not as complicated, and this used nope. to be a bipartisan thing. Yep, It's not as complicated as, you know, today's leaders are making it out to be. Well, we got to have this program and that program, and we got to have a place for the kids to play, and we got to have conflict resolution programs. It's like, no, you just got to take the worst of the worst because a very small percentage of the population commits the overwhelming majority of the crime, and you have to have a place for them to go because they cannot live in a civilized society. And it's over. That's it. 